Hello, and welcome to More Intelligent Tomorrow. A wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. How are injectable biosensors going to flip the healthcare equation up on its head? We'll discuss this and more with Ben Huang on today's episode. And now, your host, Ari Kaplan. Ben Wang, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks a million, Ari, for having me. It's great to see you again. You're looking good. Happy yeah, great. Birthday. You as well. Great to reconnect. And yeah, you're up to some exciting things with uh, Profusa and uh, wanted to you know, just tell us about uh, what, what you are doing right now. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. So Profusa, we're a, a small company up here in the Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And we've developed a platform that really allows an individual to get real-time biochemistry information out of their body um, in a way where it's clinically relevant, where the data is accurate enough and is what doctors actually care about, but do so in a way um, where the intrusion on a person's uh, life is very, very small and at a cost base uh, that really um, is uh, very well aligned with kind of consumer-based type products. So for the cost of a pair of sneakers, uh, our platform allows an individual to get real-time biochemistry, things that normally you would have to get a blood test for today, um, but get that in real time so that a physician could actually manage care uh, with you uh, agnostic of time and space. So you could actually have that kind of a physician to patient conversation and get that insight without having to be there in person. Yeah, it's, it's great to see that embracing. And you know, I understand you started off with, um, you know, an injectable biosensor. Um, so tons of questions about how that actually works. But, you know, uh, the understanding is it measures the oxygen level. Can you tell us more, like, what, what information are you collecting? Sure. Uh, so the idea, the concept is actually quite simple. I think, I think the whole notion uh, that we can leverage technology to peek inside your skin and understand what's happening inside the body, I think it's a vision uh, that's been around for quite a few decades. I and mean, people have tried to go after it. Most of the time, what you want to measure is so small in terms of composition of the overall uh, tissue, uh, that is really difficult to do, just go through the skin, if not almost impossible. Lots of people have tried, lots of company, companies have tried, but it's just been very difficult to do. And so the barrier has always been, how can you get a sensor inside the body that's as, as, as non-intrusive as possible, but do so in a way where your body doesn't mind it being there? And the last part is actually a very important part. The body doesn't mind it being there because you, I, and I think anybody else is actually listening to this podcast uh, would know that your body is exquisitely good, just exquisitely good at determining what belongs inside the body and what doesn't belong inside the body. And our, what we've been able to do at Profusa is actually to create a sensor that doesn't elicit uh, or doesn't succumb to the effect of that foreign body response. And, and it's really right here. Um, I have this little vial, and if you could see inside there, are these little green slivers floating around. I don't know if you could see that well with the background on my hand. And each one of those little green sliver is a quote-unquote sensor. That little green sliver uh, is completely passive material. It's uh, made out of a class of material called hydrogels, which is the same class of material as soft contact lenses. And that hydrogel has embedded on it uh, fluorescence chemistry. And it's just chemistry that gives off light. That's it. There are no electronics. There's no battery. There are no coils. It's not like a chip that you put in a dog where you could track a dog's movement. This thing is so passive. It's just it's it's just basically like Jello material. Um, and you put a little bit of that inside the body. Um, without a reader, that little piece of material is completely inactive, completely inert, and doesn't give off information uh, at, uh, about where you are or, or what's happening at all. But now that you have that little sliver of hydrogel under your skin, it's bathed in the environment of your cells. Uh, what, what other things can you measure? Can you measure like allergic, potential allergens, poisons, iron level? Yeah, I think, I think whatever is available in the interstitial fluid, it, we ought to have the ability to actually measure and pick up. So we have a long, uh, a long list of things that we can measure that we're working on in the laboratory. I think the question actually is, and this will be a fun question to ask and fun question to figure out, right? Uh, 
just because you can measure a thousand things, do you really need to? And the question actually is, what are the few, the critical few that you can measure continuously that gives you 80% of the answer that really could change the world? If you measure oxygen, glucose, and lactate, you actually have a perfect metabolic sensor. And then you actually could change the people's lives who actually suffer from metabolic disorders forever. And if you capture kind of glucose, oxygen, sort of metabolic disorders and respiratory disorders, you've already touched about 30% of the patient population worldwide. Great. And, you know, so you're starting to collect data or you have been for many years. Uh, do you use like data science or even artificial intelligence to do things like, you know, predictions of healthcare diagnoses? Yeah, we well, so right now our data scientists are working on algorithms to actually refine and get the information and the, and, the, and the data that we get out of the body with greater fidelity and accuracy. And so for we have a large data science team, and that's, that's a big chunk of what we actually are doing. As more and more people adopt our technology, and as we get more and more uh, real live cases of people who are using our sensor, then absolutely. I think we're, on, we're just in the early stages of what we're talking about. You know, the power of th what this technology could bring to bear really is this notion that you could, you could um, start thinking about individuals as individuals and then predict the bad things that could happen to an individual based on their biochemical signature, right? Uh, you, you know, it's a crude analogy once again, but um, I, if, if you go to a hospital today, and you um, you say, hey, doc, I'm not feeling that well, and the doctor is going to draw some blood from you, what what they'll tell you is this range, you know, like, oh, yeah, your sodium is normal, your calcium is normal, your glucose is normal, and the range is actually a pretty broad range. But that range is basically a Gaussian distribution of all the people who are actually healthy and have taken this blood uh, blood test, and they, they stick it into this range of healthy. But in reality, um, each individual likely will have a different range of what optimum is for that person, right? Uh, I may be on this end, you may be on this end. Um, and right now, physicians or, or healthcare community will think about that kind of information or kind of data to say you're healthy in the normal range versus not based on very crude parameters, age, BMI or, uh, or, or, or uh, weight, and family history, a little bit of genetics, but not through genetic testing, a little bit of genetics to say, hey, this is disease running in your family, and that's it. Um, we think the power of technologies like this is the ability to actually be much, much, much more refined in a physician's way of going after an individual's healthy decisions to say, you know, you keep eating that bread because this bread doesn't seem to have an impact on your glycemic level, but you really have to stay away from refined sugar because it's got an outsized impact on your, on your glycemic level. And I think that kind of refinement of binning or bucketing individuals in much smaller buckets uh, is ultimately where the power of this technology is going to bring to bear in healthcare because that's going to control cost and increase effectiveness, right? And the only way that you could actually get there, I think, is to, to your point earlier in your original question of artificial intelligence machine learning is how do you actually get this large volume of data and have this data not only with the data of biochemistry, but actually with outcome and choices. And cho the choices that changes the biochemistry marker, that changes the outcome, when you can marriage those, marry those three things together on a more individualized basis, then I think you really, really change the world. You fundamentally then flip the healthcare equation on the on, up on this head, which we all want to, to go from a very expensive lagging indicator of curing to a very much more inexpensive leading indicator to preventing. Yeah. So, so Ben, I know one of the challenges is convincing government or policymakers that you be need to be proactive versus just addressing something after the the symptoms are already there. So, what are your thoughts on how to do that, or is this something, uh, you know, with the healthcare as it stands in America, that will take a year, five years, or longer? Yeah. Um, the silver lining for the COVID pandemic gets created an urgency around healthcare, or at least the infrastructure of healthcare in the U.S. today, 
that a lot of people have been talking about, but very few people have done much about, just because of the grit that happens within uh, the, 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 the U.S. healthcare system. So, so for example, right, and this is a big example, um, listen, this will not be the last pandemic that we're going to face. There will be other pandemics that come down, down the pipeline. But, the, the, but what this pandemic that hit our shores, uh, I think I've highlighted, is that in order to, to create a, a, the, a better response for the next pandemic, you got to do at least two things, uh, many, many things, but at least these two things you got to do, right? One, you got to test early. So you have, to, you have to create some infrastructure or some way to get, uh, get insight and test as many people as early as you can so that you can put the right you know, quarantine or, or uh, uh, mitigation efforts in place. And then the second thing is you have to be prepared that in case that doesn't uh, go well, the early testing doesn't go well, you have to create the hospital infrastructure or the room in the hospital infrastructure to be able to uh, accept and embrace the large volume of patients that may be able to hit the doors. The second silver lining of COVID, right, is that it really shine a light on kind of this formula, if you will, that I just described. And, you know, telemedicine as a small example, I think got a shot in the arm for five years. I think the whole telemedicine adoption got accelerated by five years because of the pandemic and the lockdown, right? So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that the shock to our system, that, that the current pandemic, I think has woken a lot of people up and realized that, hey, the urgency of fixing this is quite real. This is not something you could kick the can down the road for the next administration and next administration. And ultimately, you have to save. The, you have to do this well because not doing not doing this well, the cost of that is two two trillion dollar packages of bailing people out, GDP declining by forty percent for a quarter, right? Untold hundred, you know, tens of millions of people out of jobs and the economy that's you know, in tatters for a couple of years. There's nothing that compares to that catastrophic outcome that you don't you want to live through again. So if 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 changing this formula to create a better efficient healthcare system so that you could triage patients better, remote care, remote monitoring, get everybody covered and such, if that costs a hundred billion dollars, spend the hundred billion dollars. Because if you don't do that well, it's gonna cost you four trillion plus later. And it's a great investment. So the listeners may not know Dr. Lee Hood is like he, he did the genome sequencing and is like one of the modern leaders of that whole foundation. Um, so you just knocked on his door and uh, without knowing who he was and say, "Can I have a job?" Or you yeah, are you want to know? You, you want the real story? You want a long story? You have enough time? Do you have enough tape sure. for this long story? Yeah. Listen once again. Feel free to edit this out, right? Because Ari asked. That's the only reason I'm answering. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so. In, this is how embarrassing this whole situation was. I knew so little about science, and this God's honest truth. I knew so little about science that uh, that I figured I'm going to go to Caltech and I'm going to try to find a job. But I knew nothing about science. Literally, I just started a PCC. Right? I didn't. I, I was a high school dropout. I just started at a community college. I had taken an intro to bio class and an intro to chemistry class, and that's it. I knew nothing. And um, but I thought, why not? Everybody needs a Everybody needs trash cans emptied. Everybody needs toilets scrubbed. Everybody needs t- test tubes washed. I scrubbed toilets at Dodger Stadium, right? I, I, I vacuumed. I, I knew I could do this. So I went and knocking on the door and figuring, you know, having Caltech and getting close to this and it would be kind of cool. Uh, I knocked on a couple of doors and these graduate students would look at me like I was crazy. It's like, you guys need, like, I'm knocking on doors. Hey, my name is Ben. I'm from PCC. I'm looking for a job this summer. Do you guys have a job I can have? They look at me like, no. And then I would go on. And so finally, one of the postdocs said, listen, you should go to, a, it was like by the third door that I knocked, one of the guys ni- nice enough said, you should go to the office. You should go to the biology office. And this is where it is. Get a catalog. And the catalog would have all of the professor's names in it. Find one whose work interests you. And then ask the professor for a job because the work interests you. Not just knocking on doors. Right? Nobody's going to give you a job doing that. I said, thank you for the tip. So I went and got a catalog. Now, uh, how do I say this? I could read the words, but I couldn't understand what the heck the words meant, right? Because it's all in scientific jargon. So I, there's no way I could find out whose work I liked better. I just didn't know. I didn't understand a single anything. So I had the brilliant idea of saying this. 
I don't know what I'm doing, but if I get a job in a lab where there are four people, I would be a person number five, and I would stick out like a sore thumb because everybody would know I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm going to go find the job uh, in a lab where uh, there's the most number of people in the laboratory. Then if they give me a job, I could just hide. Nobody would know who I am, right? And so Lee Hood had the biggest lab in the Department of Biology. He had 200 people in his lab because he was such a well-known scientist and had all these grants from the NSF. He, had, he was a, one of the National Science Foundation's biotechnology centers. What I didn't know about science was the reason you have really big lab is because you're so famous and so accomplished. Everybody actually wants to work for you. Well, that wasn't my logic. I knew nothing about science. And the odds of finding a job in a small lab is much higher because it's a brand new assistant professor and the person's probably just you know bored and wants somebody to talk to. Anyways, I knocked on Lee Hood's lab. And um, it, it took like two floors at the Beckman building. You know, it's a huge, huge place. Dr. Hood wasn't there, of course. So I knocked on the door and I found a, guy, a lady named Joan Kobori, Dr. Joan Kobori, who was a lab manager, a postdoc and lab manager. And I went in and <clears throat> asked for Joan for a job. And Joan says, no, sorry, I'm sorry, we, we don't have jobs here. I mean, I said, but look, I, I told her, I said, you, that sink right there, there's dishes in there. You want me to wash them now? Like, I'll go and wash them now. You don't have to pay me. I just kind of want to do this. She laughed. She said, well, we have people do that too. I said, well, how about that trash can? I see that trash can's got paper towels and it's full. She just laughed. She said, listen, all right, you really want to work here. Yeah, I get it. We have a found, we, we don't have jobs, so we do have a fellowship. And in, in Caltech, it's called a SURF, right? Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. We have a fellowship. Yeah, it's a three-month fellowship. It pays $3,000. Uh, here's an application. Why don't you apply for this fellowship? And then uh, I, I went back and um, filled out the application. But there was nothing to fill because it was my name, address, phone number. And that's it. It asked for publications. I had none. It asked for experience and research laboratory. I had none. It asked for the classes you've taken in science. General biology, general chemistry, that's it. It's a very short application. And then I just signed my name and brought it back in like in 10 minutes, you know, typed up. I brought it in 10 minutes. So that's a lie. About an hour. And she asked, she says, oh, uh, do you have any questions? I said, no, my application is done. She said, well, that was fast. And I told her, I said, well, it's fast because I have nothing to write down here. And I told her, and, and at that point I told her, I said, you know, Dr. Kobori, I, 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 I could get it, right? I sound like I sound like this crazy kid coming off the street. I don't deserve this fellowship. I understand that because I, I wouldn't know enough to even know what I want to do because I've done, never done anything like this. But I do just want a chance. And if you give me this chance to just hang out and around the lab, I'll, I'll contribute. I don't know how, but I will contribute. And she's like, don't worry, Ben. It's fine. Don't worry. You, I'll, we'll let you know. And I got a fellowship. The other nine people, the other nine people, you know, we're all seniors. They all had tons of experience, right? It was a very competitive fellowship, I found out later. They just took pity on me. So uh, <laughs> I got I got one of the fellowship spot with a blank resume. That, God's honest truth story. And, and that from made there, my I, I, fell, I fell in love with science uh, from that moment on. That, that story just made my year. I never knew that. And incredible perseverance, true American success story, going from bat boy to knocking on doors to biosensors. Yeah, that's kind of you, kind of you to say that. Although if I uh, had I known better, I probably never would have done it. I mean, you know, ignorance is bliss in that situation. I think my my <laughs> ignorance of how science worked actually landed me in Lee Hood's lab. Had I known just a little bit, I, I never would have done it. Ben, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you, Ari, for thinking of me and inviting me. I appreciate uh, you're considering me for this podcast. It's always fun talking to you. It's good to get reconnected. But what you're talking about is important and it's obviously a passion of mine. So please keep up the good work. Thanks. And you too. Everyone is uh, wishing you all the best since it's such an important uh, market that you're helping create. Yeah. Well, keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully we have, uh, we'll be successful ultimately in the long run. <laughs>